Okay, so we're back. And yeah, you had a bad day. You've seen me too many times today, but this will probably be maybe the last. We'll see how it goes. Uh, today, well, and by the way, I want to um, express my appreciation to Fred and, and the discussions there on, on uh, um, uh, liquid cool or leak detection and things. Um, that actually flows very nicely with the discussions we've had today where we started out looking first at the problems of deployment of liquids in data centers, then we looked at the concept of reference designs. We talked about FMEA, and their, uh, the presentation you just saw was basically in, uh, incorporation of FMEA, if you will, or those kind of applications and principles into a practical solution where you have leak detection. Um, now we're moving on to the wonderful world of standardizing connections. And if there's um, uh, things that are very controversial, the concept of trying to do the same thing over and over again seems like it should be simple, but a lot of times it's complex. Uh, today, once again, if you uh, should recognize the three contestants of, up here, contestant number one, John Musilli, contestant number two is John Minash, and contestant number three is John Gross. And today we're going to try to talk to you about why the world should be standardized in terms of connecting your liquids. Um, and for the past, as I said before, we formed the, uh, formed the Advanced Cooling Facilities Group back uh, a little over a year ago. We've had over 60 meetings with this group. We've socialized these concepts with a broad base. We're still evolving the white papers, um, but uh, the concept of moving the industry herding cats in one direction is basically the OCP theme. We're trying to learn how to deploy at scale. Um, the people that have participated to a large extent in this are the ones up here, as well as John, our correction, Valley Sorrell, who wasn't able to participate, as well as there's been a fair number in our community from other groups that have also stepped up. We, um, the concept of setting up standards requires a broad-based support to believe. Um, so we'll kind of jump through. This is some of the things that were covered in the white paper, and I'm not going to go through all of them right now, but the benefits of standardization, the compatibility with OCP advanced cooling solutions. We talked about pipe diameter standardization. We talked about that briefly earlier. Uh, vendor product and FWS uh, standardization. FWS, for those that aren't familiar with it, facility water solution or facility water system, that is the area that we're addressing. Okay? We're addressing where the ITE connects to the facility water. Um, and uh, so if you have a CDU that's supplying your downstream, that is outside the scope of what this paper is supposed to address. The CDU will protect your um, IT and your cold plate from that. But let's kind of go through a um, uh, general statement here. Success at scale requires standardization and ability to exchange IT. What do you think of that concept? Do we really need to standardize? Is there a benefit to try? Everywhere in the world, someone wants to do something a little different. Why, why is it a benefit to try to make the, the world a standard world? Well, the, the way that I look at it is, you know, years ago, um, you know, when I first got into the industry 20-something years ago, um, basically every rack manufacturer, uh, every server manufacturer had some sort of different form factor. Um, you, you'd go down, you'd go into a, an air-cooled data center and you'd see racks of different widths, racks of different heights, uh, racks of different depths. It was kind of a hodgepodge of everything. Nothing really kind of lined up. And the industry came, basically came together as a voice and told the manufacturers, we can't have this. We have to have some alignment. We have to have uh, some consistency in the offerings from the IT manufacturers so that we can make this more modular and, and deployable. And I think right now where we are in the liquid-cooled um, world is we're in the same place today that the air-cooled world was 15, 20 years ago in terms of we have a number of different form factors of solutions, whether it be connections, whether it be temperature ranges, pressure ranges, so on and so forth. Um, and we're starting to try to work towards driving consolidation and alignment of those, uh, those different vendor solutions. Great point. So, John Minash, you work with a vendor organization. Is it easier for you to have your products have a different kind of adapter everywhere in the world to line up with uh, China or North America or Europe? Or is it easier to have a one connection point? And um, just give your thoughts on that. No, it's certainly easier if we can uh, be standardized across the world. Uh, it's a challenge. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it, it makes it easier from a, a lot of supply chain. You know, the same connector, we're buying more of them. Um, 
connection, familiarity, um, standardization across our products, especially products that interconnect. It, it helps all the way around. Um, and it's a, the benefits of standardization keep rolling out the more you look at them. And um, the difficulty, again, is uh, local, local standards, local habits, uh, mm -hmm. changing those. Okay. So one of the problems we face is one of the key tenets of OCP is open, okay? What does that mean? It means there may be a really, really good connector type that your company likes, a quick connector or whatever, but, or one of you likes. Um, how, do, how did what we do enhance that or oppose that? What was our thoughts on, on using uh, the uh, Shane or uh, Parker Hannafin or some connector there? What, what were we thinking about there? Well, I, I think there were kind of two things that came out of that. One is it was such a simple thing to resolve that we only probably spent about 32 calls on it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that, that we kind of tried to realign on as, uh, as a work stream, because we kept going down into conversations about quick connects and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, as a facility water system, our line of demarcation is really where we hand off to the ACS solution. Um, that line of demarcation is really more a, uh, of a basic uh, pipe joining method, whether it be threaded or, uh, or grooved or uh, flanged. Any one of the, the quick disconnect uh, products is going to have to mate to uh, a flange or a groove or, or a thread just based on how they're manufactured today anyhow. So instead of trying to get into the conversation of we're gonna recommend this disconnect or that disconnect or so on and so forth, we kind of moved our line of demarcation and said, no, 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 at this pipe size range, we're gonna be a thread. At this pipe size range, we're gonna be a flange or, or a coupling. And then you can hook up whoever's quick coupling is your uh, brand of choice or your, your model of choice to that based on this standard thread or this standard flange or this standard coupling. Yep, so John Minash, can you make that personal? Um, just Throw out Vertiv here. Mm -hmm. Does Vertiv um, use one thread, or do they have a, a, a thread that they put out in North America, a different thread that they put out in, in Europe? How do, you, uh, how do you manufacture? So unfortunately, we do have a lot of different threads that we use around the world. But we are, uh, as a company, moving towards standardization um, and moving away from when we can um, threads that are pitched threads, uh, just okay. from a quality perspective. So generally concept, kind of summarizing what we just said, we're not pitching threads as being the best way to put together anything. We are saying that the quick disconnects, they all pretty much always will thread into a rear door heat exchanger if you're actually doing on your facility water solution connections, okay? I guess for the FWS, if your um, uh, door heat exchanger is connected to a, um, or your, your um, uh, immersion tank, if it's connected dire uh, directly to an FWS, there's gonna be a thread, and to that thread, in most cases, you're gonna put in some other kind of connector type, or not. You may actually use the thread as being the type, especially if you don't see yourself interchanging these frequencies. Having said that, the goal of this committee was to just pick a thread type and say, let's just try this. Let's just try picking a thread type and seeing what happens over the next couple years. If we say the OCP recommendation not requirement, but the recommendation is that vendors start moving toward this one thread type. Who here has tried to put together a pipe system in their backyard uh, that uses thread or something like that? Any of you guys try to do that? <laughs> Any of you guys have fun with that when you try to use a different type of thread than what the a garden hose thread is? I tried to do this. Buying adapters is just a pain. And actually using, figuring a thread gauge to figure out what type of thread you're getting and especially now the internet. You don't even shop at Lowe's anymore. You go online and you got all these threads and you don't even know what's coming to your doorstep and how do you figure out that one thread is exactly what it is? Can you actually, if you thread something together, is it possible to put a wrong thread into a, 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 a correct, uh, John, I see you, Mr. Massilli. Absolutely, I, see you. I mean, just, just classic stuff. You, a parallel thread will go into a taper thread. It just stops at a different point. And what happens if you do that? The, it'll leak. It'll leak, but in some cases, will it leak a lot, or will it just like a? Well, it could. You could. Um, well, what would traditionally happen? You'll see the wrench marks on it. They'll just grind it down until the two mating surfaces right. are so tight. But eventually, it'll leak. Yeah. Well, so and, eventually, and I think, I think what you'll get. <clears throat> sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that's one of the challenges with the tapered thread. Um, you know, we talked about tapered thread versus parallel thread, and one of the challenges with tapered thread 
is you basically tighten it until it snugs up, right? So if you're tightening it till it snugs up and you're actually mating two incompatible threads together, you don't know if you're actually tightening a yeah. correctly oh, just fitted, fitted tapered joint or if you're actually just getting to the point where you're cross-threading two incompatible threads. Right. With a parallel thread, that's not a thing. You're either gonna tighten it all the way up against the O-ring or it's gonna cross-thread and lock up. So, so if you've ever done, and I'm not a plumber, but every now and then I get called in my life to do plumbing problems. And I hate plumbing problems. Because when you put something in and you tighten it to a certain level and it doesn't drip now, and you come back three days later and it dripped one drip an hour, is one drip an hour a problem? Yeah. Is one drip an hour a problem? It is under your sink, yeah. It is under your sink, it is over your IT rack, okay? <laughs> <laughs> one drip an hour is a problem. So long story short, um, the best way around this, we surveyed the industry, we talked to people in uh, Europe, we talked to people in Australia, and we picked a thread. We picked British uh, BSPP, which stands for? Uh, British Standard uh, Parallel Thread. Okay. Um, shortened as BSP very often. And that's because there's, and we also came up with a recommendation. So this is the kind of the recommendation. It's not a requirement. And here's what will happen in the world. One of two things will happen. Well, one of three things. One people is people won't even bother, and then the world will still be a bunch of different threads. The other is people say, okay, I'm going to, if, it, uh, if some, the requirement says OCP recommended, I'm going to go uh, and use uh, BSPP, okay? The third is they will ship an adapter. Uh, they'll do BSPP and they may ship a NPT adapter, uh, which I think is what Veritiv does right now. We do that with uh, some of our products. We have to ship a, uh, an adapter for, okay. uh, for different markets. North America, for example, we design, um, we design some of our products that are you know, a metric thread, and when they come here, um, it, we will ship an NPT adapter to, to, with them. Yeah. So jumping forward, this is for dimensions, and we actually talk to people, where do you actually have, uh, are using threads and quick disconnects? And it turned out that an inch and a quarter, or DN40, and an inch uh, and DN25 are typically the s diameters that we're seeing um, under two inches. And that's where people are using these connections. Do I have a comment, or was there a question? Or? OK. So then the other aspect we looked at was for things that are two inches and bigger. And we came up with two choices. One was a uh, coupling. And the other was a, a flange. And what we looked at here is, and we have a lot of, uh, we're not going to have time to go through all the basis of how we did the analysis. But those were the choices. And what you're looking at here, kind of go back up here a little bit. One of the key criteria we looked at our recommendations is what can you verify? How can you ver Are there connections that can be verified? And the amazing thing is, uh, many pipe connections cannot be verified. And if a pipe connection cannot be verified, then you go back to the, the presentation on leak detection and protection, because if you can't verify it, if you can't verify, you have no prediction of reliability. Um, and some examples of that, fuse connections can be exceptionally reliable. They can be fantastic. But if you can't verify they were done correctly, you have no basis for reliability. Um, so kind of walking through this, does anyone else help? I don't know if you can even see this. The concept that we talked about, we'll, we'll take it first on thread, uh, with a thread connection. Do you think that you can ever verify that you're not going to have a leak on a thread connection? No. But with visual verification, do you feel that you could um, uh, have some confidence that it's not going to separate or have a major failure? Odds are will not separate or have a catastrophic failure. So, Right, so an inspection process, generally speaking, we're not going to, so the level of protection you would give that would be maybe a leak detection, um, and you'd try to make sure you don't have threaded um, connections right over your rack, or if you did have them over your rack, you'd have drip trays, leak detection, things like that. Flange, the same thing. What's with a flange? Is a flange something that you can guarantee is going to be, uh, uh, would you say that it, flanges never leak? I think what, what we have with, with uh, particularly flanges and threads, uh, I mean, realistically, when you, when you commission any of these systems, you're going to hydrostatically uh, pressure test them to look for right. leaks day one, right? Um, with things such as threads and flanges, one of the things that you know when you do those tests is that you don't have a, a leak today. 
but I don't think that you can say that you know, for over a 20 year lifespan that you can't develop a leak. One of the most common things that can cause leaks to develop is that you know, as the building settles, as, um, as people are working on things, as, as uh, vibrations and whatnot mm -hmm. in the system occur, you're gonna have some pipe movement and that will put stresses on, on those connections and, and they can potentially over time uh, leak. One of the challenges with, uh, with bolted flanges, particularly as you get to the larger diameters, is the sheer number of bolts that you have uh, on that flange to, to give you a nice uniform clamping force. Um, so I believe, if I remember correctly, a, a six, inch, uh, six inch flange connection, I believe, has eight bolts on it. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to, they have to be properly torqued, they have to be uh, cross torqued. So it's not just a go around the circle, you have to go in the star pattern across in order to properly okay. torque it. And over time the gaskets and the, the joint and everything can relax. Um, so day one confirmation, yes. Lifespan. Okay, so what you have is something you're pretty sure it's not gonna fully fail. If you have oh, a, for sure. Um, but there's a potential, again, it goes back to the equation we talked about before, and leak detection and, and protection. If you had a flange and you uh, see that in a high risk area, you put a flange where it's not a high risk area, or you put in a flange where there's leak detection and protection. And I, I think with, with all of these, you know, when they, do, when they do develop leaks, it's important to remember that they are very, very, very unlikely to go from absolutely completely dry to spraying water somewhere. They're typically gonna start with a drip somewhere, um, very slow leak that if left unattended could potentially turn into a spray. But it's extremely unlikely that they'll start right. with a spray. So the third category we look at, groove couplings. And there's a lot of different groove coupling products out there. There are some that actually have been designed so a visual inspection can guarantee performance for life. And you can actually take photos and make it an auditable, traceable uh, methodology. And so that was the category we looked at, and I can throw stats on that if we want, but for our time, we don't have to. If people want to see more about uh, full disclosure, I'm obviously with Victolic, I can show the stats and the numbers and the, uh, the data on that separately if you'd like. But that's what we're looking at here. We also looked at weld, and uh, what are the positions on weld? And by the way, the first three categories are things that you can take apart easily. Welds, not easy to take apart, but welds are, very, very good. Are they perfect or not perfect? So, I, the, so Intel was a welded shop. That was their, their go-to solution. But the little tutorial that I got during this process, and I, I wasn't, it wasn't that I was the designer for the welded systems, but that was the requirements that we had for, for facilities, is that it's highly influenced by the skill of the welder, even though you could do some, you could do some x-ray and some other stuff, but at the end of the day, it's, either, it's the skill of the welder, and then that weld, depending on the slag or other uh, impurities that might be on the inside of the pipe, will eventually deteriorate or could deteriorate and leak. Yeah, and so I, I like to use an example that actually came from a project that I worked on. It was a mission critical project. It was a 911 call center with multiple uh, data centers in it that, that supports uh, a lot of central Texas. Um, and that was all welded and flanged uh, pipe throughout that entire facility. And uh, on top of that, it was all shop welded uh, piping. They brought the, uh, they, they prefabbed everything, they brought it out to the site, they put it up in place, they bolted it, torqued the, the flanges and so on and so forth. Um, and we did a hydrostatic pressure test and we had a shop welded um, uh, flange uh, at, at the weld done in the shop that actually leaked day one right off the, the uh, hydrostatic pressure test. Um, fortunately, that particular contractor had an, had an audit trail with the way that they did their fabrication, so we were able to trace it back to uh, which welder on which day uh, found out, ironically enough, Monday morning. Anybody ever have that? Monday morning, Friday afternoon issues? <laughs> um, so it was, it was a Monday morning, and the contractor ended up having to go back, and uh, because the piping was all in place, they couldn't do um, uh, x-ray welding because, or, I'm sorry, x-ray inspection uh, because of the environmental hazard to the other people in the area. They actually had to ultrasound every single weld that that particular welder did on the entire job at their cost, uh, which added about a week and a half to the, uh, uh, the delivery of the chilled water system. So we don't have a whole lot of time in today's discussion, but I will also say I used to live inside a welded pipe, okay? Give that one one more time. Um, and I will say that after 1963, you went to Subsafe, and uh, the subsafe records, I could probably have tracked down the grandmother of every welder uh, be, and also the radiography records of every weld that, uh, that was done on a subsafe system. We maintained meticulous records and we did 100% radiography after we lost the submarine. That having been said, 
I lived inside a welded pipe. I believe welds can work. So we're, we're not trying to ban them. We're just trying to put in content. They are artwork. Um, uh, and it takes, uh, I don't know, any of you here, anyone here ever weld? Uh, you comfortable in doing a pipe? Okay. What's it carrying? <laughs> anyway, we don't have a whole lot of more time on here. Let me kind of uh, fast food some of these things. Uh, if you go to our white papers, you'll find that there's uh, a, a lot of detailed, more information, documentation on where we came up with these conclusions, uh, MTBF uh, information, uh, research and uh, studies. Uh, there's uh, looking at the failure, potential failure modes of couplings. There's a look at how you can certify a coupling as being properly installed with a photographic method. There's discussions on flanges. There's a uh, discussion on welds, the positive, and what you're seeing here is uh, a weld leak, and the interesting aspect is that's not at the weld. It's actually above the weld, at the heat affected zone, which is one of the things that comes from an improper weld. Mm -hmm. Looking here at a fusion, this is a download of, of all the things. I actually went to one of the uh, leading manufacturers of fused uh, pipe that are used in some areas of data centers, and these are all the things they said you should check to make sure that you did a proper fusion job. None of these things can be checked after you actually did the fusion. So when you walk up, the ability to visually inspect whether or not the fusion was done properly is not available. That almost takes us close to the end of time, I think. Uh, not the end of time, but the end of our time. Um, so call to action, similar before. If you want access to this information, if you want to provide input, uh, feel free to do so to us now or uh, rejoin our calls in the weeks. Any comments or questions? I don't want to say this is the last you'll ever see of me, but I'm not going to be speaking again today. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>